Bueno, pues vamos a seguir con, con esta conversación. All right, we are going to resume our conversation. Vamos a seguir, señora. Esta conversación que so we're going to resume our conversation that's entitled by Le Chevalier. In front of this in moderation, the attitude or the virtue of dialogue. So well, we, would, we just wanted to mix uh, to mix different voices here. This is one of the characteristics of this project. So we want to know what this sentence entails, actually. And first of all, it will be Remu who is reflecting about this virtue of dialogue and this, and, uh, this uh, issue of this immoderation or disproportion or arrogance. Then we will invite Alicia Sintes. This is a very special invitation for us from San Luis, and she is our first scientist in these trovadas, but to me it was very interesting to have her among us because she can, she can provide another dialogue, and this is the dialogue that she actually establishes with gravitational uh, waves and how this scientist can exercise this dialogue. And then, we will close with a poet, Natalie Handal, who is with us to, to bring this creative side, which is also a pillar of our project. So I will leave them the floor. So, good morning, everybody. As Christian was saying, we cannot just take for granted that we're thankful. I really wanted to express how thankful I feel towards Michel and Agnès and Sandra for the participation, for inviting me to take part in this. And I would like to thank the team of Las Trovadas for making absolutely everything so that we can have this dialogue, they really facilitating the dialogue. And this is all the more important nowadays. So again, uh, in front, uh, confronting the contemporary immoderation, the virtue of dialogue. And Sandra was saying this, we want to, to bring Camus to the subject, actually, because, well, but of course, it may be difficult to, to bring a, a writer who's passed away to speak about uh, an era that he does not know about. So actually, I would like to express something, and I would like you to reflect upon this and to see, uh, according to your experience, what you can draw from what I'm going to say. So I would like you to own these texts and to experience them. I would like to start with a concern that immediately arises. When I was asked to think about the dialogue, I was trying to assemble texts that talk about this issue. And I was thinking about two different eras. First of all, we're talking about the quote of the, uh, the witness of liberty. It's the Second World War and uh, the beginning of the 50s. And actually, there is an article that talks about this in a remarkable manner. And I'm going to read an excerpt. This is an article of 1946 in Neither Victims Nor Executioners. It's called The Century of Fear. It says the 17th century was the century of mathematics, the 18th century of the physical sciences, and the 19th century is the century of biology. The 20th century is the century of fear. 
So some will say that this is not a science, but first of all, science has something to do with it, since it is the latest theoretical progress that has led it to deny itself. Uh, moreover, if theory in itself cannot be considered as science, there is no doubt that it is nevertheless a technique. What's more striking here in our current world is that most people, except believers of all kinds, are deprived of a future. There is no valid life without projection into the future, without the promise of a maturation and progress. So you can see that this resonates what we were hearing yesterday from Camille de Toledo about the wound and destruction. And this is in parallel with another article published in 1945. Camus is one of the few voices in France to to talk about the impact, the human impact, and the philosophical impact of the nuclear bomb and its use in Japan. So another excerpt that will, that will move us towards dialogue and towards the main topic that we want to develop in this participation. Well, there's an, er an excerpt from the same uh, article which talks about dialogue. The long dialogue of men has come to an end, and of course, a man who cannot be persuaded is a frightening man. So alongside the people who did not speak because they think that it is unnecessary, there is still an immense conspiracy of silence that is accept accepted by those who tremble and give themselves good reasons to hide this tremble from themselves. I'm not talking about the cleansing of or the purging of artists in Russia because that would benefit the reaction. You must keep quiet about the Anglo-Saxons maintenance of Franco because that would benefit communism. So, you know, this is uh, very much related to, to that time when he talks about, but uh, this is also valid for the contemporary world uh, now if we take some perspective. And the article follows. I, was saying that fear is a technique and we live in terror because persuasion is no longer possible, because man has handed over entirely to history and can no longer turn to that part of himself that is as true as the historical part and which he finds again in front of the beauty of the world and of faces. Because we live in the world of abstraction, machines, offices, and we suffocate among people who believe that they're absolutely right whether in their machines or their ideas. And for all those who can only live in dialogue and in friendship of men, this silence is the end of the world. So this is the issue we were talking about yesterday. I mean, is the end of the world upon us? Or are we just living in the last decades uh, since Camus wrote these articles? I think that the moment that we're living is absolutely in line with this observation. I'm just going to give some ideas. The spaces for debate are more and more rest restrained. And lying and manipulation have been imposed as something that is inevitable. And this is what, what all political ideologies resort to, this lying and manipulation. And we can see that everywhere in the world. And violence remains a resource to get to political goals. And this is actually, if you want to conquer or defend the power, you're going to use violence. And actually, well, fear is a technique. We can see that. We can see that, for instance, with social media. This has changed the way we communicate in the world. And this is a revolutionary way to communicate. We can see also that social media may be the focus of different revolutions. So we can see that as well. There's also the technologies of weaponry. There are so many things that allow the group to remain at certain distance from the victim. And it is within this that our era is highlighted. Actually, we, we were pushing to this immoderation, and this is what Camus was already seeing at that time. Now, I would like to propose some, some thread in my work for the last years. I mean, how could dialogue be a limit to the violence that we're living in? In 1946, Camus 
already put into perspective the main problem of his time, the murder for political uses. And he, he, he talks about murder with the notion of dialogue. And here an, is an excerpt of uh, Nous Autres Meurtriers as Killers. There is only one problem today, and that is murder. All our, of our disputes are futile. Only one thing matters, and it is peace. And the masters of the world are unable to secure peace because their principles are false and murderous. In all countries, those who refuse to kill wake up. They denounce the false principles and begin on their own account, a reflection, a dialogue, an exemplary approach that will at least demonstrate that history is made for men and not the contrary. Those who do not want to kill must speak and say only one thing. They say it without respite, like a witness, like a thousand of witnesses who will not cease until murder in the face of the world is repudiated definitively. So it seems that killing is a systematic way to oppose. And uh, Camus has chosen his path, and his path is dialogue. And in order to escape the tearing between silence and death imposed by history, dialogue represents a possible path that is articulated with with sincerity, and this is the source of these developments. And I think that this is the way to incarnate dialogue. I mean, so far we've been talking from a literary perspective, and I think that there is also an approach that is very much articulated in language. And there is a text which joins these two ideas, and this text is addressed to a friend of Camus that we find in the notebooks. And uh, this is a text that we find from 1945. And it's interesting to read it, because you can see how things are articulated between this literary perspective and this commitment. And this is a passage, actually, that is addressed to Louis Guillaume. It says, all the misfortune of man comes from the fact that they do not use simple language. If the hero of the malentendu, the misunderstanding, has said, here you are, it's me and I'm your son, this dialogue would have been possible and no longer false, as in the play. There was no longer any tragedy, since the peak of all tragedies is the deafness of uh, heroes. This is the progress of dialogue. It's the dialogue at stake for men. So this is where I am. And the absurd is a community of people struggling against this. Now, if we choose to serve this community, we choose to serve dialogue to the point of absurdity against any politics of lies or silence. That is how we are free with others. Being free with others, I think that this is the challenge chosen by Camus at the end of Second World War, favoring dialogue everywhere favoring and dialogue and avoiding misunderstanding or lies or murder. By making this possible, by recreating this original link that unites human beings, dialogue becomes an alternative to oppression. And if the 20th century is a century of fear, it is also the century for diverse oppressions, actually. And these series called uh, Neither Victims Nor Executioners nor executioners shows this. And it comes with an article that is entitled Towards Dialogue. And it says the following, but we must defend this dialogue and the universal communication of men with each other. Servitude, injustice, and lies are the scourges that break this communication. So we have to refuse this. And this is a plague. This is a scourge. And it's a very matter of history. And in spite of all, we consider this as a necessary step. But we cannot escape history, because we are diving in history. And we can claim to fight in history to preserve that part of men that does not belong to it. So to dialogue is to create a space, to create a space that leaves some space for difference, as we were saying yesterday, actually also during the round table. Uh, dialogue leaves a space for different culturals, uh, cultural ideas, different possibilities. And actually, this text develops this idea. And everything that is said is that, well, uh, 
we do not think about murder. We are, have to choose. If this can be done, we would then be divided between those who accept murder and those who refuse it. And this division exists, but this is at, sti at least the progress. So we see that there's a work by Camus who tries to clarify uh, this division and to favor dialogue. And we think that this notion may be ambivalent, and yesterday we were talking about this. There may be an ambivalent dialogue that can lead to polemics, but it can have some arguments. And here we find again the text, the initial text, where the quote comes from, actually, where the title of this uh, conference comes from. And this is a text that was pronounced in 1948. And it says there's no life without dialogue. And over most of the world, dialogue has been replaced today by polemics. The 20th century is a century of polemics and insults. It is taking place between nations and individuals, and even at the level of formerly disinterested disciplines. Thousands of voices, day and night, are pursuing its own tumultuous monologue, and they pour a torrent of mystifying words, attacks, defenses, exaltations onto peoples. But what is the mechanism of polemics? The mechanism of, of polemics is considering the adversary as an enemy. It simplifies him. It refuses to see him. And here again, I think there's another step to consider the, the difference. And this is actually goes in the lines with what was said before. It's the way to consider the other, to leave him a place, to leave a place for difference, to allow him to express himself. And this is central. And Camus, this is what he practices. This is his own commitment as an artist, and this is what he puts in play. And this is what he shows in his commitment. There's also a text that comes from the witness of freedom, and it talks about the role of artist. And he says that artists must be like a kind of spark for dialogue. They have the role to, to launch the discussion, to kick off discussion. And as I was saying before, the spectator, the reader, has to own this posture and incarnate this posture. It is not fighting that makes us artists. We are the witnesses of freedom. And this is a justification that we have as artists. And sometimes we pay the high price for it. And actually, we find this very often in history. And the world allows us to commit, even though we are, by nature, the abstract idols. So you can see that the artist has a real role to incarnate this dialogue. And this dialogue must leave some space to the other. But Camus has understood this very well. It has to think about the other at the light of history. And you will see in the following text, in the following excerpt, that he talks about references that are you know, very familiar to French people. But I'm sure they will be familiar to the Spanish audience as well. And he talks about the world of uh, the penalty, which is the other which is the ours, and we think that we will be eternally Girondin. So after all, this bad position, by its very inconvenience, makes their greatness. The day will come when all will recognize it, and respectful of our differences, the most worthy among us will then cease to tear themselves apart as they do. They will recognize that their deepest vocation is to defend to the end the right of their opponents to disagree with them. So here we are recognizing the other, and I believe that it's even clearer or goes further beyond in the way in which dialogue is placed on a political level. Now I'd like to go to a different excerpt that, well, for me, Camus tries to summarize 
his approach towards the Second World War, and this is uh, a thread that he's going to be pulling until he had his accident, car accident. And this is also reminds us of the way we are meeting today. There's this political engagement, and there is an article that is entitled The New Social uh, Contract. The movement of peace of which I have spoken should be able to be articulated within nations or communities of work and across borders and communities of reflection. The first of which, according to mutual contracts in the cooperative mode would relieve the greatest possible number of individuals, and the second of which would try to define the values of which this international order will live, at the same time as they would ple plead for it on every occasion. More precisely, the task of the latter would be to oppose clear words to the confusions of terror and define at the same time the values indispensable to a pacified world. A code of international justice whose first art article would be the general abolition of the death, death penalty. A clarification of the principles necessary for any civilization of dialogue would be its first objectives. This work would respond to the needs of an era which finds in no philosophy the necessary justifications for the first for friendship which today burns in Western minds. But it is obvious that it would not be a question of building a new ideology. It would only be a matter of searching for a way of life. I believe that from uh, that moment, from the Second World War and his experience of uh, resistance, he's going to continue developing this idea and looking for it and re researching it. I've made reference to historical moments and he is actually looking for references in the international and particularly after the 50s or since the 50s he's going to be referring to Gandhi in an article by 1957 he's got published with a, an article entitled the sock and the spinning wheel where we see that a word the word becomes act or action a political strong political act in order to oppose oppression. And in this sense, he's got an articulation of these fixed categories of violence and non-violence that we consider in a um, strict way, but we've seen that, in fact, they're quite porous. Well, I believe this is a reference that is important in Camus, particularly with regards to the war in Algeria. And I'd like to finish now with some words about how I imagine these meetings and perhaps a last excerpt from 1957. And the writer receives the Nobel Prize for Literature and has these words. Each generation, no doubt, believes it is believes it is destined to remake the world. My generation knows, however, that it will not remake it, but its task is per perhaps greater. It is to prevent the world from unraveling. Heres of a corrupted history where fallen revolutions, techniques gone mad, dead gods, and exhausted ideologies are mixed, where mediocre powers can today destroy everything but no longer know how to convince, where intelligence has stopped to the point of becoming the servant of hatred and oppression. This generation has had to restore in itself and around it from its own negotiations a little of what makes dignity of living and dying. Faced with a world threatened with disintegration, where our great inquisitors risk establishing the kingdoms of death forever, it knows that it should in a sort of mad race against time, restore and peace between nations that is not that of servitude, reconcile work and culture once again and rebuild an art of the covenant, covenant with all men. So it's an extraordinary program that he could experiment. And in this sense, I'd like to make a, share a last thought um, and compare what gathers us together here and Camus' uh, lives, uh, life and work. And this is, well, he referred to the reflection community within the international. And uh, during uh, almost a year, there were these meetings in 1949, meeting people of all sorts. There were doctors, 
uh, factory workers, intellectuals, and they try to reflect together. Yes, but also act together. And they wanted to act in order to protect life, to protect life. This is one of the main principles of this group. It was also to welcome writers and intellectuals from the international scene and to welcome them in their country when they were in danger in their own. So I think there is here a clear link between that and what we're doing to now, this support of young intellectuals and artists, the international support, this meeting together in, in the Mediterranean basin and also the diversity of profiles and voices, but nevertheless find a resonance in between them. And I hope that this will resonate from with what you've perhaps found in the works by Camus that I presented to you. Thank you. Good morning. I would like also like to start thanking the organizers of the Trovada for having invited me to participate in this meeting, and particularly in this uh, edition under the title uh, There is no life without dialogue. This has also allowed me to go back to my origins, face them, and also come back to my um, birthplace. This is a very special place, and perhaps some of you don't know it, but this building was the new theater of my father. It was the room of uh, my father, so the new theater of my grandfather, the, the living room for my father, and now it is the polyvalent room for you to enjoy as well as for the whole village to enjoy. My participation in these uh, trovades, well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I found that it was quite of a curious thing because I'm not a literature person. I am someone who doesn't know much about Camus' work. I am a scientist, a theoretical physicist. I am a member of the Institute of Special Studies in Catalonia. I work in the University of the Balearic Islands, and I am also a member of the uh, Menorcan Institute of Studies. I'm very proud of that. I am also participate in many different international collaborations like LIGO. I, what I do is that I study gravitational waves, the new messengers of the universe, these new uh, messengers that bring us the poetry and music of the universe. In 1957, as it has already been said several times, Albert Camus received the, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature for the work he carried out highlighting the problems related to uh, his current uh, awareness. And now we have these technical problems. But don't worry, that's just normal. So the question would be, what, are, what am I doing here? Well, I think that I will reflect uh, about the enormous value of generating knowledge from, through research in any field, because this is a way of creating wealth. I would also like to reflect on the importance on, of having a scientist scientific and cultural policy for a long, with a long-term vision and this need for dialogue and our R&D and investment system and our heritage are in a clear danger, clear and immediate danger and therefore we need to act. Over 40, 400 years ago, in 1610, Galileo marked the beginning of a new era. With his rudimentary telescope, he pointed towards Jupiter, 
and discovered he, its four main moons, largest moons, and he did it on his alone, although basing his work on somebody, other, other scientists' technologies. And we in LIGO, can we see the next Porque slide, please? Because I think you have the old version of the PPT. Can you go to the next slide? So we started a new era of astronomy in 2015 with the first observation of a gravitational wave and with these very complex observatories. Thanks to the joint efforts of researchers, politicians, engineers, students, they were all working together for several decades and co continuous collaboration and dialogue are the basic pillar to be able to build science cathedrals like this observatory that you see. This first detection took place a century after Professor Albert Einstein presented his theory theory of general relativity. It's a beautiful theory. The theor theory of gravitation. I will not explain it today with, for you. It's not appropriate, but this theory predicts things such as the existence of black holes or the existence of gravitational waves. But Einstein did not believe in the existence of black holes in nature and he didn't believe humani humankind would be able of detecting those waves, the gravitational waves. And Einstein was wrong, because now we know that gravitational holes do exist, and gravitational waves were detected. And that first detection received the Nobel Prize of, for physics in 2017. And this is what has given me and my group a lot of visibility. We have received many acknowledgments. And, after, and then we also come and participate in this kind of events, like today. But this achievement, this milestone in the history of science, was not achieved by the three individuals who, who, who were awarded the Nobel Prize but thanks to the work of the collaboration in LIGO, which is composed of over 1,300 scientists spread throughout the world and who uh, participate and belong to this collaboration. Because today, big breakthroughs, breakthroughs are not achieved by just one person. They are possible thanks to the coordinated work and continuous and necessary dialogue of groups of people during long periods of time. And all this is with the goal of opening a new window to knowledge and being able to explore the universe. This milestone marked the beginning of a new era. But the observation of gravitational waves can mark many things and can even review imply a revolution in current concepts of the cosmos. Although currently we're only observing a minimum section of the universe. And perhaps you might be wondering, but is it worthwhile investing in things that cannot be applied to something, that cannot lead to specific applications that will produce some kind of performance or result outcome? Well, that's not the case. History is in demonstrating that it is not like this. We, the basic research or humanist basic is important and we need to convince the society of the importance of these studies. In these studies and the inventions that have the most contributed to our well-being in every way come from developments that were not seeking or didn't even allow to believe things 
in things or imagine things that would appear as a consequence of that research. And I could give you examples of many different fields, but as I'm a physicist, I know better the examples in the field of physics. But I, can, I could give you examples from all sorts of fields. Here, in 1922, Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach you know, they could have, someone could have told them to forget about quantum mechanics and strange stories and investigate diagnostic te imaging techniques. But in fact, without them, we wouldn't have nuclear magnetic resonance today. Or if in Iraq, if in 1928, we could have told him to stop, uh, to abandon all those complicated equations, trying to marry quantum with relativity, but that he should study things that easy were to be applied. But then, today, we wouldn't have things such as antimatter. Uh, we couldn't, would not be able to use PET CT or positron emission topography. And these are examples that I'm bringing from the world of medicine because we are now very aware of the fact that we cannot play with health, particularly with the current pandemic. Now, let's think about Einstein. In 1915, we could have asked him to forget about the his strange theory and focus on geoposition in system. But without his theory of general relativity, the GPS system would have an initial um, error or mistake error of 11 kilometers. Let's imagine that we want to go from the Molideralt from here and we would end up in Salmonferra this ground. This is something I recommend you to vis visit. But we could continue and go on. Does anyone question the value of history that helps us understand why we are where we are and allows us to imagine possible futures? And I could continue with many other examples, very humble ones. I don't know, the origin of diapers, of the micro microwave, there are many surprises behind that. The generation of knowledge is what research does. In knowledge is important, very important, and it is priceless and thus nevertheless have a great value. Although also in literature, and co these trovadios contribute to this, dialogue, communication, even between scientists is what makes progress possible. And scientists also communicate in conferences like this, discussing ideas with human contact or virtual contact, like lately is also writing scientist papers, and sometimes also with a lot of controversy. Otherwise, we couldn't understand this slide because the controversy on the um, detection of gravitational waves lasted for several decades. We live in the knowledge society and our progress is based on education, culture, research and innovation. An educated people cannot do without without its relationship with nature, nor the virtue of dialogue between all social actors. Knowledge generates wealth, which is measured in economic terms, but also in non-economic or intangible terms. If we do not generate knowledge, then we would have to import it and pay for more than just vaccines. If we don't generate knowledge, we won't be able to transfer it, and we won't be able to create anything that will add, will contribute with added value. We will have to buy everything, pay for everything. In other words, we will be doomed to have an economy that I don't know how it should be called, but which will not, of course, be a truly knowledge-based economy. The CERN is the largest laboratory of particle physics in the world. 
It was created after the Second World War, when a small group of visionary scientists and public administrators of both sides of the Atlantic identified that fundamental essential research was the necessary vehicle to rebuild the continent that had been devastated. Now it has over uh, 21 member states and over 10,000 users. Some of its discoveries have improved the understanding of fundamental laws of nature and have also allowed for important technological advancements like the origin of the internet, also the discovery of the Higgs boson. Let me and get you a little bit bored and share with you some figures that are quite away from the topic we're dealing with today. The LHC Large Hadron Collider is the largest and highest energy particle accelerator that exists and it's the largest man-made machine in the world. It costed $13 billion from its inception to the discovery of the, to the discovery of the Higgs boson, winner of the 2013 Nobel Prize in Physics. That's the price of a single aircraft carrier that visit the port, our ports. The LIGO detector that has allowed and enabled the detention, detection of gravitational waves Nobel Prize of the year 2017 costed about $600 million during its first 20 years. And nuclear, nuclear submarine cost 20 times more. The Hubble Space Telescope costed about $3 billion. Uh, and the Iraq war costed 120 times more than the Hubble over its four first years. And it produced about... 100,000 deaths, and as Jaume Carot, the president of my university and the director of my thesis said, call me romantic, but I prefer a look at the stars than a desert, a desert full of tons. Camus was very concerned about human freedom, social justice, peace, and the elimination of violence. The human being can rebel against exploitation, oppression, injustice, and violence. And by the very fact of his rebellion, he affirms the values in the name of which he becomes a rebel. A rebel. So among all these beautiful images, I would like to share a very specific example. It's called Sesame. It's the single tron light for experimental science and applications in the Middle East. Sesame was created under the auspices of the UNESCO. It's a project in, within the program Science for Peace, and it was promote, promoted by Abdus Salam, a Nobel Prize in Physics. Sir. This is currently an independent intergovernmental organization made up of, and listen to this, Israel, Iran, Iran, the Palestinian Authority, Pakistan, Turkey, Cyprus, Egypt, Jordan, and some others. I think we already heard enough about this region yesterday. It was inaugurated in May 16th, 2017, by the King of Jordan. And Sesame is a model of dialogue between among scientists in our days, in an area where we, well, that we often list, list here and see in the news. So this is an example of how we can contribute to the dialogue and world peace. And this is the consolidation of knowledge and innovation as the promoters of our future growth. And for this, we need to improve our education, consolidate the results of the education, promote innovation and the transfer of um, technology, but through the dialogue, a constant dialogue among different social actors in order to make sure that innovative ideas can become new 
products and services that will generate growth and quality jobs and that will help face the challenges that come from social changes in Europe and the world. We study gravitational waves and to explore the universe, but there's much more. There are people, there's a human capital, there's a constant dialogue with young people who re continuously renew themselves, young people who devote their lives to research and to the communication of knowledge. Even in difficult times like these, and with a great passion for it. Uh, but in spite of the advanced breakthroughs and achievements in the last decades, Spain is still not a leader within the European Union in the field of R&D and investment, and this is even worse in the case of innovation. We're lagging behind. Crisis make things worse, and there's been also even a reduction in the re resources that are devoted to research, both from the public administrations and from private companies. And all this means, unfortunately, that none of the regions in Spain uh, is a leader or among the leaders at the European level. So, it is considered that Camus thought represents the disappointment of intellectuals after the in the post-war period, and the symbol of the fear mentioned by Remy, this was not the century of that was the century of fear, but now we're in the century of disappointment because many humanists and scientists feel disappointed. But here we have these images that I really like from Facebook and so on, from Vol um, Voltaire or Einstein. Here we have, if you want to know who controls you, look at who you're not allowed to criticize. Or Einstein's quotation, everything that is ignored by Mm, man does not exist for him. This is why the universe of each person is limited to the size of his knowledge. Camus said in 1956 in an interview in Le Monde, I don't believe in God, that's true, but I'm not an atheist. This means that man is situated in absurd situations. And now, we seem to be facing a current of uh, destruction because of the lack of dialogue. And the uh, first example I could mention with God in this took place many years ago, the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. This library had as a purpose to compile the works of human beings from all periods and all countries that should be included in a sort of um, eternal collection for the future. And this appearance of this library is one of the most symbolic cultural di disasters of history. And nowadays it seems like we s still in the face of that kind of uh, a uh, crusade against dialogue and against books, against knowledge. Carl Sagan said, Carl Sagan said, what an astonishing thing a book is. Because it allowed people who never met citizens from faraway eras to meet. A book is a proof that human beings can make magic. And that's why the th thinking and the books and dialogue between different people are the object of attacks by those who feel they're powerful, by those who are afraid of words. 
It looks like the theater of the absurd. And actually this destruction follows a present. 1943, Library of Peru, that National Library of Peru, which was burned suspiciously enough. 1992, National Library of Sarajevo, destroyed by the war in former Yugoslavia. 2015, Library of the University of Mosul, the little Harvard of Iraq. But you don't need to move to the Islamic State. 2020, Biblioteca de in Venezuela. As Camus was saying, strictly speaking, the world is not absurd by itself. The world is, and the world and the absurd comes from confrontation between the sick of human being and the silence of the world, the rational silence, which is called the rational nostalgia. And this comes when our need to find a meaning is broken in front, of, in front of the indifference of the world. And sometimes I may say that mental indigence has no limits. Some weeks ago, we were so disappointed. For the first time, we were refusing to use names as Ramon y Cajal and other references in the national awards for research. However, this will be amended in the future, fortunately enough. And I know that science cannot be an excuse to take positions politically, except to support science. And sometimes it is not the case, unfortunately, due to a lack of dialogue. Camus' childhood was spent in one of the poorest neighborhoods of Algiers with the absence of books. He was part of the French resistance during the German occupation and he was related to literary movements in the afterwar. He was related to the movement called absolutism and even though his texts are something an enigma, Camus denies this label. But as Hegel said, what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. But what's true is that without a dialogue, our civilization goes towards the absurd, towards self-destruction. As a reference, I would say that we are species in danger of extinguishing everything. Camus was related to humanitarian currents, and his journalist articles drew uh, the attention of everybody towards injustices. And here there are many injustices nowadays because of a lack of dialogue. Camus explores the human condition of isolation within the universe, which looks external. It's the outsider within itself, and it's the problem of evil, evil and the fatality of death, human death, the death of our legacy, of our culture. There are many things that are at stake. And here, an example. This is my home. Now here, what you see. But my home is strong. It has resisted many storms. And today the storm is political. And this is one last absurd battle due to a lack of dialogue, to a lack of sensitiveness, to the lack of studying program, problems of proximity. But the level of the sea will increase because these little homes are submerged year after, after year by, by brine and by, and by sea water. But these homes have experienced so many things like wars and they have resisted. Camus used to fight against injustice with his own words. With what could I fight? 
because we are not like uh, Pedro Ramirez who has placed his pole in front of the sea. We are fishermen. We are fishermen. We use our boats and rows and uh, we use our nets. Camus used to fight within the indifference or surrounded by the indifference. When Hitler became strong and took power, at the beginning nobody would face him. And uh, we should have a common front to fight for what is ours. But there are small envies that are leading the privileges of the privileged ones to be lost. Are we going to let the legacy from our grandparents to be lost? What am I doing here? Actually, I do not know. It is the same that I had thought at the beginning of my presentation. What am I doing here? What can you do here? Are we losing our identity? I think that uh, the motto for these trovadas is fantastic. Uh, there's no life without a dialogue, and I would like to thank you all. And at least I didn't explain what gravitational waves are. So hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Microfono de mano. Ahora, ahora. Sí. Vale. Estoy muy feliz. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to speak English because this is my poetic language, but this English will merge with many other languages. Of course, we heard that Camus, we've, we've heard this quote um, during the, the weekend uh, that Camus says that art cannot be a monologue. We resemble one another in what we see together, in what we suffer together. Dreams change from individual to individual, but the reality of a world is common to us all. What we don't, what we aren't always aware of is of our connectivity. So someone in Algeria might not, and someone in the middle of a small town in America might not, might not know about this connectivity. Yet, we are all in it together. Camus believed in the importance of an artist's commitment to his social justice. We've heard it, create dangerously. Uh, my dialogue is poetry. I'm a poet, and poetry can move our mind and heart so monumentally that it reverses fear, discrimination, prejudice. Poetry has always been on the side of truth. Writers point to issues that need to be resisted, like racism, 
religious antipathy, patriarchy, and corruption. They have the ability to veer perspectives and influence individuals. A poem or a story can galvanize people into action or impact aims of resistance movements. As artists, we should also uphold what we preach. Our obligation should not be to a country, but to each other. Poems create spaces for coexistence. No borders exist for a poem. Poetry is global dialogue. As a Palestinian growing up, I was told I exist and I don't exist. I'm real and I'm imagined. I understood early on that the truth is multi-layered, it's complicated, and it carried many contradictions. Truth is not fully factual, fiction not fully invented. It is often difficult to differentiate fact from fiction under occupation, as reality could be surreal. A donkey might need a permit. A dead body, a corpse, might continue to be jailed because the prisoner died before his life sentence was over. Poetry allows me to share truth with its personal and historical convolutions. I'm going to read two poems uh, right now. The, the first one, I, I come from Bethlehem, and Bethlehem and Jerusalem were always sister cities. But, and it's really seven miles apart, so ten, about 10 minutes away. But a Bethlehemite, if you fall in love with a Jerusalemite, love is occupied. Because a Bethlehemite cannot go live in Jerusalem. And a Jerusalemite, if he wants to go to Bethlehem, he will lose his identity card. And no Jerusalemite wants to lose or will lose its identity card. So even love is occupied. But also in this poem, there is the element of the erotic. Because to me, even the er er eroticism is also um, an act of resistance. In Search of Midnight. He kissed my lips at midnight. I let him. He took my blouse off. I let him. Took my bra off and touched my breast. I let him. He took my pants off. I let him. Took my underwear off and looked at me standing in this strange, dark, black and white room. I let him. A small light dimmed by the window. I took a glimpse of the city we live in. Both do not know. Then he pronounced my name wrong, and I stopped him. Asked him if he has ever been exiled or in prison. If he has ever mailed letters to a woman he once loved but would never see again. If he thinks we can go back to a lover even if we might not love the second time. Ask them if he has ever robbed a small grocery store or sold bread from a peasant, if he has ever crossed seas, coasts, mountains, and still could not arrive. He answered, I did not pronounce my name correctly in my country, so I was tortured. I did not pronounce my name correctly at the enemy line, so I was exiled. I did not pronounce my name correctly upon arrival, so I was given new papers, you see. A heart in search of midnight is only a heart. Everything else is the same, except what the other is expecting. Uh, this next poem, so Bethlehem, uh, today Bethlehem really does not exist anymore. Uh, when they built the wall, uh, a lot of the Bethlehem district is now in Jerusalem. The rest of it are settlements. So basically what's left is what's protected, really, uh, that the Vatican protects, which is the Nativity Church and the few streets that are tied to it, and also the old city that was uh, around in Bethlehem. And there are seven quarters, and all these quarters have a lot of stories. Uh, and families related to them. So I am made of all these quarters, which means I, you know, coming from the Mediterranean, we are really made of so much uh, Semite, Arabic, 
uh, Greco-Roman, it's, it's all there. It is very symbolic of the Mediterranean. But of course, uh, when we speak of the, when we say the word Arab today, it carries a lot of negative weight and we forget all the beauty that it carries. So this poem is called Talhamiyye, and in Palestine, when you come from Bethlehem, you are Talhamiyye. I heard I'm an Armenian who believes the stars are pieces of lightning, history left to space. I heard I have Roman blood, and my brother is Turkish and Greek. I heard my hus, my heart, is in the mosque of Omar by the nativity beside a talisman and an old man without teeth or keys. I heard my poems turned into stones with Aramaic letters. I heard that here invaders push natives aside, natives hand their names to trees and trees re-earth, the verses freedom left. I heard I was a house made of Mediterranean light, except I only heard this in springtime, and spring might not exist here anymore. They took all of the trees. Perhaps Jesus can explain what happened, or perhaps all I need to remember is that I heard, but this I know, I'm an Arab, and the seven quarters of the old city has left me seven keys so I can always enter. So I'm also made of many other parts of the world, and I grew up really, I don't, it, uh, for someone who, who's dedicated to language, I had to think, I wanted, I wanted to write, but I don't really have a mother tongue. Uh, I, I, of course, I could say French was the first language I heard, but really I come from a symphony of five or six languages. This is how I experience the world, and uh, this poem is going to re, re sort of speak to that, although I just, I, I, mention, I don't mention all the languages. Uh, but also, although I, I carry this globalness, I'm always reminded of the deep local roots that I have. Blue hours. In the blue hour, the negrita cries, I hide not to deceive the darkness or myself. La Negrita is not far from where I stand, her eyebrows, her one hand. I too am visible now, behind the tree, behind the night, behind the cry, and all I want to say is her name and ask her. Have you ever heard your heart undressing? Seen a stray dog at midnight and realized he understands this hour better than you will understand any hour? Have you ever seen yourself in every woman with your eyes or in women with eyes more difficult than yours? Have you ever really heard your voice echoing in your nipples? She offers me tea, we end up drinking coffee, trying to reach the bottom of the cup, unafraid. Now my teeth are stained, my English failing me, my Arabic fading, my Spanish starting to make sense. <laughs> we are in a finca now. Perhaps we are safe, perhaps we desire nothing else, but I can't stop bowing in prayer five times a day. My country comes to me, tells me, compatriota, I will always find you, no matter what language you are seeing, speaking. Thank you. Uh, Camus, I've had the most profound uh, conversation, dialogue I've had with Camus is his, uh, is that of the Mediterraneanness. What is Mediterraneanness? Uh, what is it to be a Mediterranean? Uh, the Mediterranean uh, is a region where cultural, religious, and linguistic diversity converge, where ideas travel and intersect. The Mediterranean trades. The Mediterranean people are navigators and interpreters. Our lingua franca is the sea, a language born of the waves and ports, a coalescence of many tongues. I see myself 
and its crossroads. In its diversities and complexities, connections and collaborations, in its richness and power lie in this plurality. But what does the Mediterranean mean to societies today? There are numerous views on Mediterranean idea and identity developed at different periods of history to carry forth different socio-political agendas. Some contemporary scholars are revisiting and rewriting European discourses, emphasizing the Western world's Greco-Roman and Christian traditions, but not their African and Asian roots. Today, our sea is a necropolis. A deeper dialogue and awareness of this ancient history is vital, among other engagements, to address the current migrant crisis, to fight discrimination and otherness. And with this greater understanding, we also identify as Mediterranean without abandoning our affinities. Albert Camus encouraged a new Mediterranean culture, La Nouvelle Culture Méditerranéenne, in his 19. 37 lecture at the Maison de la Culture, though this lecture has been construed in dr drastically different ways. I have traveled all over the globe, but no landscape moves me like that of the Mediterranean. It weaves my body to the earth and still lets me be water. With every book I write, I'm building a geography of people and places. Uh, I wrote a book, uh, Poet in Andalusia, which was a recreation of Lorca's Poet in New York. And now, because of course, uh, when, and now I'm working on a book set in Sicily, because, and that's uh, sort of continuing the conversation from Poet in Andalusia, because Sicily is uh, a place where racial, ethnic, and religious converges and contend where Islamic, Judaic, and Christian traditions and cultures interacted at various levels from literary to economic. Maybe there I could find answers on convivencia or coexistence, I'm not sure. But what I know is that Lorca said, lo que más me importa es vivir. On this journey I discovered that real dialogue is possible if we want to find it. Because as was true for Lorca, what people want most is to live. I'm going to read one of the poems from Poet in Andalusia. And for me, in fact, uh, poetry has been my homeland. The thing about feathers. We kept only the keys, letters, photos. Everything else stayed behind when we left the house. That can happen when a nation changes overnight when those you know turn into gate of feathers. And the thing about feathers is they know what's been missed. For years I watched my neighbor's house from other windows, different countries, various homes, some of brick, some of stone. Some never imagine what a home can mean when an unfinished tune traps the ceiling. I pretend never to have seen a body mid-air, a father's hands planted on the ground. After all, what we don't admit to never happened. But I couldn't change that day in Murcia when water brought light to the door. I was seven. It is the day before our departure, the day my father gives me a notebook, and I tell him, this is where I'll keep my country. Language is a living pulse. It breathes, echoes, touches. It can be a dialogue that can lead us to spaces where we can manifest tolerance and justice, where we can learn to listen. Listen to what we imagine separates us, but doesn't. What we think divides us, but doesn't. We too often forget that the personal is a fundamental dimension of the global. Uh, I'm going to end with two poems. One of my absolute favorite lines by Camus, 
which I think I can meditate on probably my whole life, is when he said, seule la musique est à la hauteur de la, de la mer, only music is at the height of the sea. Uh, my ancestry is the sea, and music is a city. Like poetry, music comes from a place I don't know, yet I am intimate with. And in all my books, I'm in conversation also, in dialogue with this music. I'm going to read uh, these two poems. The first one uh, has a translation, but the second one does not. The second one, uh, you will not be hearing a translation because, uh, first of all, is from my, my uh, latest book, Life in a Country album, but also because I think it's an opportunity to uh, experience uh, what it means, uh, this, this feeling of otherness. Every day we are translating. We're translating each other. We're translating the other, what we understand, what we don't. But translation is not only linguistic, right? It's about music. It's about the gestures of others. It's about what we see. It's about um, how we experience the other. So I'd like to, to leave you with that note. Uh, broken music. Maybe when we are ready for music, every instrument around is broken. Maybe when we are ready for freedom, your heart can no longer beat. Maybe when you grow madness, you find what you were meant to see. Maybe if you show me how desire begs, play a tune in E minor, the slow river of wings will reveal itself. But it had to come to this instead a broken violin, a heart unresolved, an argument with Jesus or Muhammad, exile has its ways. Now my breath is a flat tune limping its way around the wake of my mouth. Muchas gracias. Before I read this poem, this last poem, I want to thank Sandra for inviting me. I want to thank the incredible team. I want to thank Carlos and the incredible team of the festival. I want to thank all of you, uh, audience, for coming and my participants for coming. And I also want to thank the incredible translators who have been our bridge all weekend. So thank you very much. Awesome. Orphic. As a child, I believed God was in the wind that carried us elsewhere, that departures were returns. I buried the sun in my father's ashtray to see him in eyes in Berlin or Stockholm, where the cold is another country longing another landscape. And the past comes back. Close the door. Solitude will not leave. Close the window, light will not escape. Close the wooden trunk, memory will not vanish. Close your eyes, home will not disappear. Close everything close, all will remain like Mostar and Jerusalem, like our Roman chant, Byzantium icons, Muslim prayers. The years passed. I looked for death in Palermo and found my mother's womb. Look for life in Thessaloniki and found the song about death. Look for my image in Venice and found all my images. Crossed Trieste with my heart in Naples without my hesitations. Memorized Marseille from Notre Dame de la Garde. Counted all my dreams in Akka. Found my name in the Colosseum. Listened to the lemons fall for hours in Rome, waited for my lover to tell me the sea can't break, and found the musician born in a small town that reminded me that music always takes us back to the cities we are made from.
gentil. Thank you very much to the three of you. You have each um, brought here the value of dialogue. I must say that I am without words right now. I don't know if anyone in the audience would like to suggest or react in any way, but for me, this poem was the, fi the perfect end uh, for this um, dialogue uh, of this session and so that we can go outside for a coffee, for a break, and then come back and listen to Josep Maria Esquirol, who's going to talk about the resonance of the world, because you have already made us vibrate. <laughs> 